Okay. Don't shame. All right, if you have a Bible this morning, turn to Matthew. Yes, sir. Turn to Matthew. I'm going to undertake to do something this morning that uh, I don't guess anybody can really do it, but I'm going to undertake to try to do it. And I'm going to draw you a picture this morning of the worst thing that can happen to you in life. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Now, boy, you'll have to, you have to have cover some territory to do that. A lot of your pastor is going to read for us. I can't. I can't read it. I can't even see with my glasses on. But we're in Matthew 26. Matthew 26. I want to have him read for you verse 24. Matthew 26, 24. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. I'll read it for us one more time real clear. Son of man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for him, for that man, if he had not been born. All right, y'all have a seat. Amen. Now, do you realize what, you, what he read there? He read about a fellow, he said that a certain fellow, a certain thing about him, is so bad that it had been good for that fellow if he'd never been born. That's quite a thing to say, think about it. You think he's recommending there, the, you know, abortion? How I many said the fellow had been better off if he'd never been yeah. born? Well, I guess somebody aborting a baby sometimes is doing right in doing that, I suppose, if you take that thing literal. Uh, you know that can't be. Thou shalt not kill, you're not to kill a baby, born or unborn. But still, what, what is the sentiment there? The sentiment is this fellow would have been better never even showed up. Well, God had him show up. I mean, God let him show up. And who is this Judas? And he said of Judas, what, what he's about to go to, to take to him, it wouldn't happen if he'd never been born, so it would have been better not to have been born. Job did that. Job said that would be cursed in the day when he said a man child shall be born, referring to himself. Did you ever get that down far in the dumps? Did you ever get so far in the dumps with a thing that you wish you'd never been born? Well, there are hundreds of people going through that right now, and I'm standing here. When I'm standing here, standing anywhere, I'm always conscious of something because of the research I've had to do. I've written a history on art, and I've got a history on artists. And I've written a history on music and a history on musicians. And I've, read a, I've written a history of science and a history of philosophy and church history and Bible history. And to get that stuff, I've had to look into about, uh, well, conservatively 8,000 books. And when you do, you see history, and when you see history, you see what happens, what goes on, and you know what's happening going on. And right while I'm standing here right now, now, here, right now, right now, somebody's being tied up against the wall and kicked in the crotch to get information. Yeah, real, not movie, that's going on. Right now, somebody's getting flayed, they're getting whipped alive. Right now, people are going through an intolerable suffering and dying and have to get plugged up finally with morphine where they can't feel nothing. That stuff is going on. It's been going on ever since Adam died. When you take this thing, we talk about what can happen to a fellow. There's all, all kinds of horrible ways to die. I've already mentioned, and I remember mentioning it, how the Germans torture them by putting a woman's hat pin about that long with the tail end and pulling, pulling the intestines with a, with a needle like that. And I talked to you about ant heaps where the Comanche Indians would take them out and bury them up to the head in sand and then put honey on them so the ants would eat them. Sometime it would take it three days for them to eat the fellow enough to where he finally died. There are all kinds of terrible, horrible things that happen to people. We had a lady in Pensacola one time that I never saw except when she was in bed. And she got some kind of, well, something went wrong with an operation. She was 22 and she spent the next 23 years in bed. In bed, go to the bathroom, have to carry her. She'd lie there and have to put some slab on them to keep the bed from sticking to the bed, to the bed sores lying there. Hands like this, couldn't move them. Uh, 22, 20, 22, 23 years lying there. She's just as safe as I am. When I'd come to see her, I'd say, how you doing, sister? And she'd say, all right. I'd say, let me hear you say, praise the Lord, sister. And she'd say, praise the Lord. She said it a lot better than you, some of you say it. Amen. 
And all the time you're out there running on, having a kind of bicycle and going on picnics and fellowship and eating in places, she's just lying there in that bed 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. That's a pretty tough way to live. Yes. You had a fellow here, I remember him from last year. He was right over here. He came in here and he had no arms and no legs. What a way to, would you like to live that way? Anytime you get feeling sorry for yourself, remember God made that fellow and allowed that thing to happen. Now it's something to think about, see? That's a terrible way to live. Go to the bathroom, you can't do it. If you want to blow your brains out, you've got nothing you can pick up the pistol with or take the pill. That's a tough way to live. Tough way to live and die. Amen. Live 50, 60 years on this earth with no arms and no legs. It happens. I never met the other one, but I've got pictures of another one just like it, but more in the same way. They're all kind of terrible things, but I'm going to draw you a picture of the worst thing that happened to anybody. And it's a lot worse than what I've been talking about. All right, the same thing start, and then uh, somehow or another they, they get worse. And a man gets worse and worse and worse. Now here we have here, I'll, have, I'll draw for you here a little, a little boy. And there's nothing in the world more cute than a little boy. Every mother thinks her little boy is the only daughter that ever lived. And he's a perfect little boy, and he may be ugly as a, <laughs> you know. I mean, I've, I've stood outside there and looked there and watched five of those kids coming through there when they put them, I don't know if they do this anymore or not, but when I was there, the daddy would wait out there for the news, and when it came, the baby would be put in a little thing where you could see it, with a blanket over it, and they'd show it to the daddy, and they'd pull back the thing so you could see the, the baby's hands and feet. You know why? That to assure him that he had a healthy baby, and not a deformed baby. Do they do that anymore? You, 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 you never been hit, brother, until you live like I live, and then you stand there five times and watch those kids be born, knowing the, what, what you live, where you live for those kids were born. Any time God wanted to take one of them and give them an auto thing, he could be born that way. He could be born with... I, listen, I've preached in places where the kids' hands were growing out of his elbow. Babies, six, seven, eight, nine years old. I preach in places where the feet came out of the knees. Women messing with pills and stuff. That stuff happens all the time. That's terrible. That's terrible. That's awful. It's horrible. But that ain't the worst. I'm going to draw you about the worst. Well, here's a little old boy here. and This little old boy is a, a lack of any little baby boy is. And like I said, Mama thinks her baby boy is the only baby in the world. And he, uh, I, my kids didn't look pretty when they were born. They looked like deformed Indians or something. I don't know, I don't know what they did. And you're, the woman will come to you, and if you're a pastor, and say, here's the baby. What do you think of the baby? Well, that really puts you on the spot, don't it, man? <laughs> I've learned how to answer it. Say, yes, sir, that's some baby. <laughs> you couldn't tell her the truth, you know, sometimes about it. But they are about, they, that's the way they are about that thing. Mothers are about babies just like uh, little boys are about dogs. Every little boy thinks his dog is a thoroughbred. And it may be a flea-bitten hound, you know, with half his ear cut off and fleas all over him. But he's got the best. Two little boys are talking to one and said, what kind of got you, uh, what kind of dog you got there? He said, well, he's a secret police dog. He said, don't look like it. He said, well, that's because it's a secret. <laughs> and he didn't look like the real thing at all. But that's how it goes. Now, here's, we'll, take, we'll take a little boy here. And this little baby boy is the most beautiful thing in the world. Nothing like it. And uh, I like babies. I like, like, like little kids. I like kids and dogs. You know, my church, and if you're uh, any older than four years old, you can come to my office and I give you gummy bears morning and, and night. All the kids come in for gummy bears. I made a mistake of giving two or three of them. They told their buddies about it. And now sometime on Sunday morning or Sunday, you get 20 kids in there for gummy bears. And I, I like little kids. I like a lot of kids. You know why I like them? Because they're innocents. I didn't go to Bob Jones to learn the Bible. I was taking convert courses from a Jesuit priest when I was, so decided to go to Bob Jones. And I was going to go to Bob Jones and a Catholic priest I was taking lessons from said, I heard that you're thinking of going to Bob Jones University. I said, that's right. He said, what would make a man like you want to go to a place like that? 
And I said, well, they say they don't drink there and they don't smoke and they don't uh, uh, go to movies and they don't dance. That sounds to me like a clean place. Amen. And I said, I've never been in a clean place in my life. And I never had. I didn't go to Bob Jones to learn the Bible. It's a good thing I didn't. I could sue him for false teaching. <laughs> you know why I went there? Because it was a clean place. A lot of things I don't know, but I know purity when I see it. That's why I like that book. Every word of God is pure. That's why I like that book. You're not going to fool me with this stuff that comes, comes around. And you take this thing about this little old boy. He comes in there. He is. He's innocent. Uh, you mothers have babies, you know how they are, and you take a little old baby up till he's three years old, you look at that kid, he'll look a hole right through you. Right. You ever look in those eyes? They're perfectly innocent. Amen. The kid's got nothing to even blink about, he just looks at you like that. Well, he looks right through you, he's innocent. Then you get to be eight or nine or ten, and then you begin to pick up tricks, you know. <laughs> You know, I've I've only had ten children, but I think there must have been eleven somewhere because there was always something going wrong that none of them did. You know what I mean? <laughs> that kind of thing. And they learn how to they learn how to use you. Those kids are smart boys. They're about five or six years old. Yo, Daddy, we want some ice cream. We want some ice cream. Daddy, we want some ice cream. And then they get to be about eight or nine along there somewhere, and they say. Daddy, Daddy, we need some ice cream. <laughs> See that thing? Yeah. That kid knows you love him and you'll supply his need, although you won't always supply his greed. So instead of we want ice cream, we need ice cream. Uh, boy, I tick, chicken out. Then they get about 15 or 16 or 13 for girls. Do you ever wonder about those names? 13, 14, 15, 16. How come you changed? Or what happened to 11, 10, 12, 10? <laughs> You said all the rest of them, 13, 14, 15, 16, said, what happened to 11 and 12? Well, evidently something happens to people around the end of 12 where you change the nomenclature. You start saying teen, teens. Well, how, no 11 teen, no 12 teen. After 12 teen, that's when the girls begin to become young ladies along in there. And then sometimes everything goes all to pieces. <laughs> they call out, I don't know what they call out, puberty or what in the world they call it. Middle age, they come that way. And this little old baby like here, look at that sweet little old baby. Ain't he a sweet little old baby? You'd never think that fellow would grow up to cut a woman's body in 12 parts and nail the pieces out, would you? One does, back in your Old Testament, the book of Judges. I've been, a, been a, around at midnight in these places like, well, like New Orleans and like uh, Honolulu and like Manila, uh, looking for the stuff and stepping over bodies going down the street like a guy drunk. But I remember one night I was going down there sometime about two in the morning and I saw an Englishman. I knew by the way he talked, you know, a soldier, and he had his hand out like this and nothing in it. <laughs> He's drunk and a skunk, man, and he'd he go down the street like this. And as, I, as he went by, by me, I heard him say, I say, doggy old boy, take me home. <laughs> he had nothing on there at all, see. <laughs> Did that come from that? Little old baby, look at here. Mama, rock a by baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. Down will come rock a -bye baby and all. That's your text. Didn't, you, didn't he have Judas in that text? He hung himself. Well, one time he was a baby and Mama loved him. And she rocked him. Down will come baby and all. And down he went. Did you ever stop thinking what a thing like that is with people? What happened to Hitler? I've got pictures of Hitler when he was seven months old and nine months old. You see little old babies sitting there with those kind of gray eyes looking at you like that. And who would think that little baby get up and kill 22 million people? There are 22 million battle casualties in World War II and that little baby starts them. Hitler never pulled the trigger anywhere in the World War. The only thing he shot at was himself at the end. He just talked. One time they asked a, a, a professor, a German professor, they said, 
you have this class full of little boys, eight, nine, and ten years old, and they, they, we've noticed that when you come in and uh, talk to them, that you always come in and then you click your heels together and you bow. And they said, why do you bow before those little old children? And he said, well, you never can tell who's there. Right. There might be a Beethoven there. There might be an Einstein there. There might be a Hitler there. You never know what's there. Right, but something goes, and what, what goes, something goes wrong. You say, what are you, the product of heredity and environment? As I say, uh, you, how, do you, how do you explain that thing like uh, serial killers? One fellow, one dirty dog, would, took a, one, one, a little girl one time, and he hit kidnapper, and they phoned back to her parents about once every six months and make them listen to him while they cut off one of her fingers. And they got to put the screaming little girl he still had and they never did catch him and put her up for the phone and then cut her fingers and make mom and daddy hear it. Well, well, he was a baby himself, the guy doing that. How do you can't account for that? What happens? Oh, it's a heredity. No, it ain't the heredity. It ain't the heredity. Oftentimes you find a guy live like the devil and he has a boy who gets saved and called a priest. It isn't heredity. You say it's environment. It ain't environment. Adam and Eve had a perfect environment. And boy, oh boy, they were mess, make a mess of things. Think about that thing. While well, they had it perfect. In the school they're taught that you're an amoeba when you begin to begin, and then you're a frog with your tail tucked in, and next you're a monkey in a banyan tree, and now you're a doctor with a PhD. <laughs> I mean, they teach you came up from nothing to where you are. No, man, you were at the top and you went to the bottom. That's what happened. Perfect heredity. God was a father. Perfect environment. No sin. No war. No sickness. No medicine. <clears throat> no work. No sweat. Perfect heredity. Perfect environment. <coughs> Boy, what a mess of things. One time a fellow said to an old Christian woman, there isn't any devil. There's no such thing as a devil. And she said, well, if there ain't, I sure would like to know who does all his work. <laughs> Another fellow said to a lady one time, a Christian old woman, a lot of them up in Carolina, said, don't you know the devil is chained up in the bottomless pit? And she said, he sure to have a long chain, don't he? <laughs> now what are they trying to tell you? Well, they're trying to tell you this. <clears throat> Here's a room here, and between my mouth and between your ear, there's something there you don't see. So I don't believe in a devil. <clears throat> well, and you're pretty lopsided. He's called Lucifer, and he speaks before Adam speaks. The first words that he speaks in the, New in the Old Testament is, Yea, but he said something before that. He said something before Adam was there. Right. Right. Isaiah chapter 14, before Adam ever showed up at the beginning, he said, I'll uh, put my throne above the stars of God. I'll be like the Most High. That was the devil there. And he comes along and he comes along and he enters and he's not dead. He said to Jesus, I own the kingdom of the world, I give to whomsoever I will, and Christ didn't even argue with him. There in this room between my mouth and your ear, a spirit. And that spirit is uh, to make you immune to the truth and working on you. Folks have jokes about the devil. You might have some jokes about the devil in the sense of any devil, but no jokes about Satan. Right. Satan, he said, is the wisest one he ever made, perfect in wisdom and beauty. Who? That's what Christ said about the devil in Ezekiel. Right. Here, the anointed cherub that covers and is perfect in wisdom and beauty. You won't outthink him. There's somebody in this room right now that right now, if they could get you, they would be glad to cut off your arms and your legs and kill your wife and burn down your house and kill all your children and put you in hell and he'd never even blink. That's right. Amen. That ain't no joke. Right. That ain't no joke. Something happens. Something goes wrong. What is this little boy? What happens? He comes in and he comes in and he's just as pure as driven the snow. And then this goes wrong and that goes wrong. And what is it? That's the work of the devil. All right, now here's a little boy here and he's born and he comes in here and he's a baby and just as cute as you ever wanted to see one. You never saw one any better. And mama just loves him like to, 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 to death and never think anything would be wrong about him. And there he shows up. And then what does he do? Well, uh, the, the mafia call a murder a music box when they take a fellow and kill him and they put him in the back end of a car and close the trunk then park it in an airport parking place where nobody will find it for about four or five days until it begins to smell. 
and then you lift up the thing and they call it opening the music box. <laughs> they started out like this. What happened? Something happened. Something happened. All right, this fellow, there's, there's that spirit in this room, and I'll tell you there's another spirit in this room. What is that? Christ died. When he died, he said, if I die and come gum up by there to heaven, he said, I'll send down the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will come down here and convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. So there's some, there are two spirits in this room. Now, there are four spirits in the Bible. What man knoweth the things of man and save the spirit of man that is in him? Even so, no no man knows the things of the Spirit of God. There's the spirit of a man, the spirit of God. There's the spirit of the beast. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? And there's an unclean spirit. That's the devil. Four spirits. Now in this room right here, there's one spirit. You're not one soul, you're different souls. But everything that's walking on two legs here has the same spirit. What? The spirit of man. The spirit of man. What man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man is in him. Even though no man knows the things of the spirit of God, that's why you have to be born again, you've got to get another spirit. Amen. All right, everybody's got the same spirit. Now, they don't have the same uh, 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 soul, but they've got the same spirit. And every animal was flying or swimming or has four legs or two legs or a spider or something with uh, uh, 10, 15 legs on it, whatever it is, it's the spirit of a beast. And then there's an unclean spirit. There's a spirit here in this building right now that uh, uh, comes from a man who loved you enough to die for you and pay for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day from the dead according to the scriptures. Wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him, seeing he liveth and make intercession for them. There's somebody that when you go to trial you should have for your uh, lawyer. Amen. He's called an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When I have the judgment, thank God I don't have to be my own lawyer. Amen. I've got a lawyer. Amen. And he's already taken the rap for me. You can't try a man twice for the same offense. If I had to, I'm not going to appear this way, but if I appear this way right now as I am before the judgment was judged for my sins, uh, the devil would stand up and say, he, he's got to go to hell. He's unsaved. He's sinned. You said the way to sin is death. Depart be cursed and everlasting fire. He got to go to hell. He's guilty. And the Lord would call me up before the thing and say, what do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. No contender. No contention. First commandment, guilty. <laughs> broke it. <laughs> Second commandment, guilty. Broke. I bro broke it. Amen. Third one, fourth one, guilty. 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 <laughs> That's my testimony. And to get through that, will say, oh, give them to me, I'm going to take them to hell. And uh, about that time, I'd say, I'd like to have my attorney for the defense to come in. Amen. <laughs> and in comes Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The trouble is, he was the judge. <laughs> and he comes down out of the judge and says, all right, I'm in his defense. Amen. And I say, well, the, the devil says, well, if he committed these sins. And the judge says, he didn't commit those sins. And he said, well, he did too. And the judge says, uh, I paid for him. Amen. You can't arrest a man twice for the same offense. Amen. That's it, boy. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground. That's all of the seven of the religions are sinking sand. My attorney paid the, paid the bill for me. Can you imagine what's going to happen to a fellow who turned that down? It's the judge you're going to meet, and it's the judge, the one that died for your sins. How would you like to stand before somebody who loved you enough to die for you and have him say, take that bum out there and put him in hell, don't bring him back. Depart from me, you curse and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You, would you like to hear that? I don't think so. You take that thing, what you're doing, if you don't trust Christ, what you've done, you turn up, turn, turn up your nose at your freedom that he got you and to give you free. Nobody, for, for, for some of Harding's friends, and Harding was a, a Bible-believing Christian, and they used to, some of his buddies used to kid him about it, some of the fellows in the Senate. And one time they had a bunch of them together just kind of playing, for, playing uh, making a little fun of him. 
And one of them said, uh, Mr. President, do you believe in the devil? He said, yeah, I believe in the devil, you know. But he's very short, short. He, would, he wouldn't talk much. And they said, well, what does the Bible say about hell, Mr. Pre President, you know? And he said, it says you don't have to go there. That's all you have to know about it. You don't have to go. Then why go? If you don't have to go. If you paid for your sins, you can't send you to hell. When you die, you don't have any sins on you. You're sinless. You don't have to go to hell. If you come up there and you go to hell, how'd you get there? God didn't want you there. Look at here. Depart from you, cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for who? The devil and who? The devil and Again. Are any of you the devil? No. What would you be doing there? That's right. Are any of you of his angels? No. Well, stupid, how would you get to hell? <laughs> Somebody goes, he said, depart in everlasting fire, and you have no business there. Right. He fixes it so you don't have to go. Amen. But you've got to come by this way to get through. That's right. So one day this little boy feels a knock at the door of his heart. And the Lord Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and sup with him, I will sup with him, and I will sup with me. And he said, Well, Jesus, I'm not old enough to be saved yet. I don't understand just yet. And Christ said, Remember thou now thy creator in the days of thy youth. The days don't come that the evil days upon thee when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. But he gets older and older and older and older, and he's growing up. You say, when does God start dealing with a child? I don't know. But I know this, you don't have to worry about the real little ones. The little ones are innocent. They're not saved in the sense of the new birth. They're not saved in all the sins being paid for because they haven't committed any sin. They're innocent. Amen. You don't have to worry about somebody without out disease and that kind of stuff. Or somebody that's a moron or an imbecile or something. You don't have to worry about those kids. They're not saved, but they're innocent. That is, you know what they were like? They were like Adam and Eve were before they fell. So you don't have to worry about the babies. Don't worry about them, but you, you folks ain't babies. You're something you don't have to worry about. Amen. And that little boy gets older and older and older, and one day there's a knock at the door of his heart. And he says, that you again, Jesus? And Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if I hear my voice and open the door, I'll come and up with him, and he with me. How about it? He said, well, I got baptized. And Christ said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, yeah, but they told me I, when I got baptized, I got born again. And he says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he says, well, I'll get saved later. And the Lord says, all right. And then he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call him while he is... While he is, while, while he is while it's near, the day is going to come and you're not going to hear him anymore. Knock on the door of your, your heart. You see, so how will they have to be before the saved? Most, most people don't know what they're talking about. Say 12 for some reason. And you don't see what reason it is. You get reading your Bible. And when Jesus Christ was 12, that was the first time he was aware of his, of his divinity. When he was 12 years old, he's in the, in the temple there talking with the wise acres. And his mother says, didn't you know that I am my father, Joseph, seek you sorrowing? She's covered up for him, you know, like he had a legitimate marriage. So she says, Joseph, your father. And she knows perfectly well Joseph's not his right. father. Amen. Right. So he corrects her and says, Mama, you got it wrong. Wish you not I might, must be about my father's business? Amen. He said, if Joseph was my father, I'd be in a carpenter shop. That's right. But I'm in the temple. Right. He was conscious of the fact. I don't know how that thing uh, works, but I met up about it with something. I, if you believe what the, the text, and you know me, I believe the text. Amen. But you take what that was, you know what that thing was? That was him going in that temple. They didn't find him there for three days. And going in that temple, he was in there messing around with the Bible and looking at the Bibles. And he opens up the Bible. And it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And the Lord said, that's you, son. And he said, me? He said, yeah, look down again. His name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. That's what he's reading in there. 
That's when he's aware of the fact that he's deity. And until then, he's just raised like any boy to raise. Increased in favor with God and man, just like a normal boy. But he hits that thing there, and then he sees it. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chasm of our peace was upon him. You're going to suffer that, son, right there. That's what he's on. And he tells mom, he said, I'm about my father's business. What? Fulfilling scripture. That's what that thing is. But that, not till 12 there, so it's just like a little boy. I remember one time I was preaching up in North Carolina, and I and a pastor went to a lady's house there, and, and they came in to talk about her soul, her husband's work, but he was saved, and she was saved. She was a good woman. She loved the Lord, and she believed the book. And she had a couple of kids there. She had two little boys. One of them was eight years old. One of them was about, oh, must have been about 14. And we talked about her soul, and she said she was saved. And we said, oh, job out, job out, your boys, are they saved? And she said, uh, well, the oldest one there, he's saved. I said, how about the other boy? And she said, well, he's too young to be saved. And uh, I said, well, how old does he have to be? And she said, 12 years old. Well, that wasn't true, you know. The boy was on the floor there playing with some toy cars. And when she said, well, my, my little boy's not old enough, I said, well, he doesn't have to be old enough to be 12. All he has to know is be old enough to know he's a sinner. Amen. And she said, my little boy a sinner? My little boy's not a sinner. And I said, the boy said, are you a sinner? And he said, <laughs> I said, I sometimes when the boy has more sense than mama's got. I've been with a lot of people, a lot of situations, and I recall one fellow named Archie, and I can't tell you the rest of his name, but I remember his name was Archie. That was the first part of his name. I'll never forget that fellow. He's the only really honest white man or black man or brown man I've ever seen in my life that just came right out with it. His name was Archie, and Archie was married to a Christian woman, a godly Christian woman, loved the Lord, believed the book. His daddy was a godly deacon in the church, I mean, a real spiritual deacon. And they, he was raised in a Christian home like that, and he never got saved. And he had bad company. He was mean as the devil, that guy. He was a character boy. He was a pistol ball, that guy. I mean, he'd keep the car, car at home on Sunday so she couldn't go to church. And when her friends would come in and eat, he'd tell dirty jokes in front of her to embarrass her. He was a rascal boy. And I got him there one day by himself. I came in there and sat down and talked with him. And he didn't get rough or anything with me, but he wasn't glad to see me. <laughs> And after we talked there a while, I said, Now, Archie, you're raising a Christian home. Did they ever tell you about hell? He said, Oh, yeah, yeah, it does hell, yeah. He said, My dad talks about it all the time. He said, Well, what about it? He said, Well, what about it? I said, uh, Well, uh, are you going to go to hell when you die? He said, Yeah, I guess I will. I said, You know what hell's like, Archie? He said, Yeah, I know what it's like. He dropped his head, but he's sitting on the sofa, and he said, Yeah, I know what it's like. He said, uh, What's it like, Archie? He said, well, it's a fire. I said, if you get in, will you ever get out? And his head was clear down. He said, no, I'll never get out. I said, Archie, could you tell me in the name of God why you couldn't kneel with me right by this sofa right now and you get saved and trust Christ? He said, yeah, I can tell you. I said, why? He said, I'm not man enough. I just don't have the guts. I never heard that again in 64 years. But that's the problem with a lot of adults. That's the problem. You're afraid if you get to say what mom will say, or the neighbors will say, or your children will say, or your boss will say. You don't have the guts. That's the problem right there. Now I like little children because they're honest. They speak up. I remember one time I was preaching out there on the street, and I still do preach on the street. I heard you had preachers on the street here the other day. And thank God you did. And thank God they had enough guts to go. But you think I'm preaching on the street and I'm drawing a picture out there. I used to carry a portable easel with me to unfold and preach on the street. I always get a good crowd. And I had a bunch of kids coming home from middle school. And they're all about the same age except one of them. And one of them was a boy about, oh, must have been about, I guess must have been about 12 years old. But he was a tough little kid. And they let him play with the boys 14 and 15 years old. And so he did. And I was witnessing to him. And I got through with the, with the picture I was drawing. I got through with the picture I was drawing. I said, are you boys saved? And there were five of them or six of them standing there, and they said they were saved all except one boy. His name was Ronnie. He was standing right at the front like this. 
a good kid, good kid, but tough a little kid. And I said, uh, Ronnie, are you saved? He said, no. I said, don't you want to get saved? He said, no. And one of the boys behind him pushed him in the back and said, go on, Ronnie, get saved. Another one pushed him and said, you don't want to go to hell, do you, Ronnie? <laughs> and Ronnie went, mm -hmm. And they said, well, go on, get saved, Ronnie. And he turned around and said, well, leave me alone. I'm trying to get up enough nerve. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah. That's straight. I like the kids because they're straight. Straight. They come. My one time, Diana, my little girl, her mother, her father-in-law, gave her a four dollars for a present, and she said, "Daddy, what am I going to do with this four dollars?" I said, "Well, you tie it." She said, "What's that?" I said, "You give a tenth to him. You take four dollars, give him a tenth of it." She said, "Well, then I, I'd be getting more than he'd be getting." <laughs> and I said, "Pray for me, sister Leon." <laughs> Now those kids can put you on the spot, boy. I never forget one time I was a witness to a fellow went to his house and the wife was in the front room and he was in the back of the kitchen doing something. And I told her I want to talk to her husband. She said, "Go ahead." And I went back there. The minute later, I heard, I heard him saying, "Get the devil out of here before I put you out." And I came back to the living room on my way out the front door, and his wife was just shocked. She said, oh, "I've never heard him talk that way to a preacher before." Brother Rockman, I'm so sorry. I, never mind, never mind. You can't win them all. Went out the front door. I started down the steps. There was a boy about 10 years old sitting on the steps like this. The, the thinker. And I, I, I had done, done well in the house, so I thought I might get one on the fly going leave, one leaving. So I said, buddy, are you saved? And he said, no. I said, well, do you know how to get saved? And he said, well, what do you think I'm sitting here thinking about? <laughs> And I said, peace me, and sat down beside him, got saved, man, in less than five minutes. Amen. God saved you. But they shoot straight with you. My, old, my oldest boy, David, he got saved by, 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 through a collie. And there's a collie just come over our trailer, and uh, a real b b beautiful animal. I forget his name, but I think it was Rover. And he loved David, and David played with him. And then that, that shepherd dog would run off back to his master, whoever it was, and we never found out who owned him. But he knew when David was getting out of school, he'd always meet him there, and they'd play and bounce around the yard with a stick, you know, and balls and stuff. He loved dogs. And one night after a, a meeting I had, and he'd come to the meeting with the family, we went by, and he was awful nervous when he got back to the trailer, he had a top bunk to sleep on. And he just kind of was messing around. So what's the matter, David? Nothing, nothing, nothing. And he finally got up there, and after he'd been up there about 30 minutes, and I was in the other room, he said, Dad, come here. And I came back, and he said, I said, what is it, son? He said, are there any dogs in heaven? And I said, uh, no, without a dog. He said, I don't want to go there then. I said, okay, that's what you want. Okay, and walked back into the other side of the room. About 30 minutes later, I said, Dad, I heard him say, come back here. I came back, and he said, he talked like a man 50 years old. He's on the top bunk and he gave a baby sigh. And he said, well, I might as well get this over with. <laughs> got down, got on his knees and got saved. Well, those, the kids are like that. See the street. My little girl, uh, my little girl Rachel, and she got saved. Uh, she got saved in the bedroom and trusted Christ. And when she did, she came in the living room and grabbed me and said, guess what happened to me, Daddy? I said, well, said that. she said, I got saved. I said, you did? She said, yeah, where? I'll show you. Come here. <laughs> she took me back to the bedroom and pointed to a place. I kneeled there. I got saved right there. I said, well, thank God for that. Praise the Lord. I had prayer with her. I went to bed. And an hour later, she wasn't asleep yet. And I went by the bedroom and heard her sing her. And she was singing, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. I'm saved. <laughs> yeah, that's great, man. That's straight. That's straight. And time went by, and time goes by, and time goes on, and time goes by. One day there's a knock at the door. Is that you, Jesus? As yes, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice, and I'll come sup with him and he with me. How about open the door? Oh, Jesus, I don't believe that old stuff about going to heaven and all that business. Day, about hell and all that business. I don't believe in that. I've been to school. I know about quadratic equations and how to get the cube root out of a number and 
Stegosaurus and Triceratops and Diplodocus. I don't believe I, I, that. That Bible for old, old women and little kids. So I don't, I don't take that anymore. And Christ said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He that believeth not shall be damned. He said, well, you're just quoting the scripture. Well, he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, if you're just quoting the scripture, I don't believe the scripture. He that believeth not shall be damned. And he says, well, all right, okay, all right. I, I know what the trouble is. I'm just having a little few sexual problems here. and I'm, uh, I, I'm going I'm to save someday, but not yet. And Christ said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Remember thy, the Lord in the days of thy youth when the evil day has come not upon thee. And you know what's happening? That voice out there is getting quieter and quieter and quieter. And he said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. you got them all over the South. Boy, have you got them in the South. I preached for many years in North and South Carolina and Tennessee and Kentucky and up through there. And I know many a fellow in his 80s who's been to two or three revivals every year since he was a child and isn't saved yet. They're all placed over there. Old Geese is 70 and 80 years old. They've got one foot in the coffin and the other one ready to kick the bucket. And they, don't, they, don't, they still don't respond. Uh, you know, if you have your faculties and don't use them, they're going to wear out. Well, I made it a habit, and thank God he's held me up through it, to walk a mile a day, or jog a mile a day, and I've done that over 50 years. My walking at night and my bare feet on that cement is the distance from New York to San Diego and back twice. That's what the thing is, a mile every 300, a minimum 300 miles a year going back and forth across there. And going back and forth there, all through that thing, God has taken care of me and taken care of me, and taking care of me, and if it weren't his grace, I wouldn't be here. But I've, I've gone out there. I used to run three miles at a time. I can't do that anymore. I can walk, but I used to go three miles at a time. There wasn't a time I ever put my foot down there in the cement at night that I didn't think about two of my friends who are in wheelchairs, and they're both saved, and they can't use the legs anymore. And I would say, thank God you're with me. If I've got any legs, I'm going to use them as long as I've got them. Amen. You got any eyes? Well, use them while you got them. Amen. For the Lord, not for the idiot box. Amen. Can you still hear any at all? Well, then do it for God. Can you walk anymore? Walk for God. Amen. If you can move your arms, then move them for God. Do something. Amen. Get, get moving. Get moving. Amen. And the time goes by, and it gets fainter and fainter and fainter. I think sometimes some of those old boys up in Carolina or up through there, I think if Jesus came into and sat down right next to them in the church and said, Hey! <laughs> You know, I think if they do, I think they'd look up and say, Did somebody say something? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. I'm aiming to get saved, preacher. I'm aiming, well, shoot, do something, man. You're always aiming, you never do it. <laughs> Why, well, time goes by, and he gets older and older and older and older. And you're not getting any younger, you're getting older. Tomorrow, 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 Shakespeare says, creeps into this petty pace from day to day. And all our yesterdays are dusty ways that like the dusty way to death. Man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. It's a, a fireplace you got. You light it, pretty soon it catches on fire and the uh, smoke goes up the chimney and the sparks fly. And the, woman turn, the whole room turns to light and then one faggot falls in, another one, another one burned up, another one. And pretty soon the smoke is washed up the chimney and the lights go out and there's nothing there but ashes. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Here today, gone tomorrow. Down in Mexico, they say, manana, 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 manana. Never do tomorrow what you can put off till today. <laughs> I mean, while you've got it there, do something. You ladies here, you're getting older. You know that? You grow up. You see me just like day before yesterday, I came home to Daddy and said, Daddy, I can't come down this street cup walking back from school because them big sixth graders will get me. <laughs> you know, beat up, you know, sixth graders. I was worried about sixth graders. Man, by the time you graduate from college, you think it's a sin to draft a guy 18 years old. He looks like a child. And by time goes by, and there he is. Now, ladies, you, uh, you, sometimes you can make a barn look good by putting some paint on it, you know, cover it up. 
to fix things up. You can look younger. I'm not against that. That's okay. But you're not getting younger. Anytime you think, oh, you can't fool a flight of stairs. <laughs> I mean, you want to see how young you are, go down to the nearest hospital and just slowly run up the four, four ways, four floors and back down and see how much younger you're getting. <laughs> All that stuff. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow creeps into this petty clip pace from day to day and all yesterdays are gone. Life is here, there's a shadow, it's gone. That's Shakespeare. Here it comes and you're gone. And listen, when time with iron shod hoof stamps across a man's face, it leaves the hoof prints, the time, the hoof print prints on his face. The book says, be sure your sin will find you out. And brother, sister, if it don't find you out, any place else is going to on your puss, on your face. Right. It's going to show. You say, how do you know? I'm an artist. I spent a lifetime studying people and portraits. I, paint, I painted uh, over 50 portraits in, in oil and over 50 in acrylic and some more. And listen, when a young girl gets to start living like the devil, she doesn't have to tell anybody. Right. Any man 20 years old up can take one look and he knows. Right. You know, you're no longer a little girl anymore. You're a woman. You've been messed with. A little soldier of purity for a for young man's lust, and it shows on you. Right. You're trying too hard to look young and sweet, and you're not young and sweet anymore. I can tell a I can tell a gambler. I can tell a gambler. Real I can tell a gambler is when you sit down with him. He's looking like this. He's watching the action. I mean, I got your faded shoot. I know a drunk when I see one. They get bags under the bags under the bags and the blood vessels go blue and the water, eyes water up. It's stamped across your face. I remember one time I was trying to sell a life insurance fellow. He was trying to sell me life insurance. I was trying to sell him death insurance. <laughs> and, we were, and we went round and round and got nowhere. And finally he said to me, he got, got, I just put the scripture at him. Scripture, 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 scripture. And finally he just got wore out and he said, well, quit picking on me. He said, I'm a, I'm a kind of a Boy Scout type of fella anyway. I said, with a face like you got, ha, <laughs> don't kid me, buddy. He had a face like a 30-year Navy man. You see, some of these ladies come down from up north, they'll come down here to die, I guess. Their husband's been working all his life and they come down here on down to Key West, you know, and uh, bring all this stuff with them. I've been many a place down there like the, the big cafeterias where you see these women that are now their husband's dead or about to die and they're about 70 and they're all dolled up like a possum hunter in pokeberry time and they got, they've got their cigarette on a pole, you know, and they rattle all the beads, got, got five rings over here and three rings over here. They're trying to look young and gay, you know, like a young lady. <laughs> no, you don't look like a young lady. You look like a 30-year Navy man just got out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why, lady? Because I'll get back to this in a minute. But you take, you take, sin shows up more than a woman does than a man. Right. A woman will get older quicker any time. Yeah. Now you have some women in the state, say, attractive, you know, at 40 or 50, but very few of them. You never find an ugly old Christian woman. Right. Yeah. The, old, the more older Christian woman, the older she gets, the, the prettier she looks. But those unsaved ones, boy, it wreaks havoc on the face. There's some ugly Christian young ones, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but not old ones. They grow. And time goes by. And one day there's a knock at the door of his heart. And it's just very faint. And it says, Bold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open, open the door, and I, I'll sup with him and I with me. How about it? And he says, oh, Lord, he says, I'll tell you what, I, I'm awful busy right now. I've got a collateral to take care of here and some affairs to take care of and some stuff to store up. And I'll tell you, I'll try to make out the meeting one night uh, uh, this week, but I can't come right now. And Christ says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And time goes by. Time goes by. And it's going by, and pretty soon it'll be all gone. It will, there'll be no, there'll be no um, manana. And one day, there's a dog locked the door of his heart, 
and just the slightest sound, it's like a squeak. And the Lord says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come and have supper with him, he with me. How about it? Oh, Jesus, is terrible, it's terrible. Something awful happened. I, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it happened to me. I didn't mean to do it. I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. And the Lord says, Come now, say if the Lord let us reason together, though this, your sin be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson. Blood, buddy, Amen. thou shall be as wool. Amen. And he says, All right, you're right. I'm going to get saved tomorrow night. <laughs> and time goes by, and time goes by. I never forget the first time I preached to Julia Tutwiler, a big federal pen over there in Montgomery. And I got through preaching and a couple ladies came down the aisle, had a big old fat sister with them, and she was crying. And I came right up to her and she came up real close. I probably told you about this. And they said, Lucy wants to talk to you about something. I said, what is it, Lucy? She said, is there any hope for murder? And I gave her the verse. I gave her the, 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 so they'll be white as snow. And she got on her knees right there and got saved. Amen. Murder cannot put you in hell. That's right. Amen. If you ever go to hell, you'll go to hell for not taking God's cure for your sins. Amen. And that's what that fellow's doing. He's putting him off and putting him off and putting him off. And that'll fix you. God doesn't want you in hell, but if you got your mind on fixed on doing it your way and turning the thing down, then that's what you're going to get. And it gets older and older and older. You're not getting younger and younger and younger. You're getting older and older and older. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. What happened to that baby? That's the baby had a while ago. What is it? One time with iron shod shod hoof uh, tramples across a man's face. It leaves the marks behind, and they're the marks. And you're getting older and older, and you're going nowhere, and you're going nowhere. Life is short, death is sure, sin is certain, Christ the cure. You know why a fellow goes to hell? Because he doesn't take the cure for sin. And this fellow gets older and older and older and older and older. And you know what I'm drawing you here, actually, and drawing for you here? I'm drawing you the picture of the inside of every unsaved dentist, doctor, senator, governor, mayor, king in this world. That's what it looks like inside. I'm not talking about outside. Maybe he drives a Porsche in you know, a Mercedes Benz. Maybe he's worth a million bucks or like with Bill Gates, uh, several million. But you know what he looks like inside? He looks like this. He looks like this. Be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says alone in the world without hope and without God. He gets older and older and older, and pretty soon he looks like something the cat dragged in. I remember one time I was dealing with a man up in North Carolina. He was an older man. Back in those days, I was a young man, very young. I was around 30, 31, 32 years old, and going through the mountains there, dealing with the mountain people and trying to win them to Christ. And I had a fellow about 72 years old. And that fellow about 72 years old was out back in the back of his backyard, nailed in slats on a pig shack. And I came up to him and talked to him about the Lord. He wasn't uh, bad or anything, a ribald, and didn't get mad at me. He let me talk, but he wouldn't get saved. And I said, why don't you trust Christ your Savior? He said, well, I'm going to study it for a while. And I said, go on, I bet you've been studying for 20 years, haven't you? He said, well, I reckon you're right. And I talked a while, and I said, Pop, why don't you just put down the uh, hammer, and let's kneel, we're in, in the hog pen. I said, let's just kneel here and you can get saved right here. You don't have to go to a church to get saved. You get saved right here. Put on the hammer, let's have a prayer, more prayer, okay? He said, well, no, I'm going to study it for a while. And I said, I said, There's something, you know something, old man? I said, you're a fool. He said, you call me a fool? Yeah, you're a fool. He said, what you call me a fool for? I said, look at you. You lived all your life with no hope and no victory. Now you're going to die and go out to hell with no hope. No, you're a double time. You're a two time loser. You're a sucker. Amen. Amen. I'll never forget that man. He'll scratch his head and he said, Well, <laughs> young man, I guess maybe you're right. I said, Come on, Pop. Put the thing down and listen to me right here and you get saved, okay? He said, I'm going to study it for a while. No, you ain't, buddy. School's out. Right. Yeah. 
the door shut, the lock's on and rusted, and you ain't going to study nothing. You're a fool. There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord, where the call of the Spirit is lost, and you hurry along with a pleasure mad throng. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? While the door of his mercy is open to you, ere the depths of his love you exhaust, won't you come and be healed? Won't you whisper, I yield? I have counted, I have counted the cost. Have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? Though you gain the whole world for your own, even now it may be that the line you have crossed, have you counted, have you counted the cost? Well, you have, you have. You know the most terrible thing happened to any fellow? Is to live and die without Christ. Amen. That fellow comes here with no arms and legs, someday he's going to have legs better than you got on right now. Amen. Yeah. Amen. He says, Beloved, now we are the Son of God. If not, not yet appear, we shall be. If we know when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, like Him, like Him. We shall see Him as He is. He'll take our vile body and fashion it like to His glorious body by that working whereby He was able to do all things to Himself. You see, you know how bad it is this fellow, if he's trusted Christ as Savior, someday he's not going to be like that. Someday you're going to be like Jesus Christ. The worst thing that can possibly happen to you is for you to wind up in a place where you can't get any help and you're hurt all the time and when you pray, God don't pay any attention to you. Amen. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the worst thing that happened to you. Amen. Is God just let you hurt forever? What could be worse than that? Not getting flayed alive. If you're flayed alive, you're dead at least in 15, 20 minutes. You starve to death, maybe it takes you four or five weeks, and then it's over, and you die and go to hell, and it's never over. Right. Amen. I remember one time I preached this message and had it like this, and I was back at the door with the pastor saying goodbye to some of the folks at the door, and I happened to turn around and look back where I'd drawn the picture. There's a big old tall skinny farmer there, one gallus, that's one strap on your overalls, and he was back there but looked, bending over this thing looking at this picture. And he looked at this picture, and I went up behind him and came up behind him and said, How do you like that? He said, Well, preacher, you done draw my picture. <laughs> I said, Well, I said, well that, that's me. I said, Well, man, if it's you, why don't you get it fixed and get saved? I'll never forget him. You're standing like this, looking at the picture. And I said, Well, if that's for you, why don't you trust him as your Savior and get saved? He said, Well, I don't know. I reckon, I reckon it's because I'm just like the man in the picture. You never do get saved. That's the worst thing that happened to anybody. Don't you let it happen to you. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, bless your word and confirm it especially now to somebody here who has never taken a step. And I pray it will take the step right now to eternal life and whatever condition they want wind in or bad or terrible or horrible or passable, they'll wind up in the right place with things fixed. Let's pray a little while while the musicians are playing. And again, I'm asking you to search your heart. I know most of you, maybe all of you, have been saved. I don't know. But if you're in here from anywhere, anytime, any place, before you go out that door, you remember something. The worst thing that happened to any being on this earth is to live their whole life without Christ and then go in eternity without Christ. It can't get any worse. And don't let it happen to you, for God's sake. Father, Save the soul that's near as hell right now. Maybe I'll have uh, uh, yet uh, 2014 on the grave, or might have 2015, I don't know. Maybe some of them, I don't know where they are, but you know who's nearest to hell right now and might make it if they were to die. And I pray they won't die until they take care of this matter. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand for prayer here. I'm going to let your pastor come here and you know, whatever wants to do the invitation. And I just hope and I pray that 
If you're here and you don't, haven't listened to the Holy Spirit yet, you do it while, you're, while God's dealing with you. Don't wait for God to quit dealing with you. God gave you a capacity to receive His Son. You're born with it. You're born with a great big hole in there that nothing can fill but Christ. Amen. And no matter what you try, money, millionaire, pleasure, fun, sex is messing around, you can't fill that empty place Amen. until the Lord gets in there. Amen. All right, brother, go ahead. Heads are bowed as he continues to play the piano here. You've heard the plea. You know what it is. Somebody here may be lost. And we're willing to take our time. I know a lot of you are saved and that kind of thing, but I know that there may be somebody here that's lost. I want to give you an opportunity. I want to ask you a question, if we could, while you're standing. If you were to die tonight, and you didn't know for sure where you were going, would you just be honest? I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise. Would you just lift up your hand? We've had them all through every service. Would you just raise your hand real quickly and put it down where I can see it? Anybody like that at all? You don't know for sure where you would go if you died. All right. By your testimony then, everybody that's here is saved. Second question. Do you know somebody right now that you could name the Lord to put on your heart that's not saved? And Maybe, maybe. I see hands going up all over the place. All over the place. Maybe we recommit right now when we see what's been drawn before us here and get serious again and understand, you know what, Lord, I, I need to pray more for that individual and I pray you'll open the door and give me a chance to present Jesus Christ to him again. I'm not talking about a stranger or somebody you don't know. I'm talking about somebody you know, somebody in your family, some close friend. Maybe you might ask God to give you that soul and allow you the privilege and the opportunity to lead him to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of being reminded of how quickly time can get by us. And even as Christians, Lord, how it can get, that voice can get more and more faint and more and more distant. I pray, Lord, that we'll use this opportunity to get not only close to you, but to draw others close to you and be a good witness and a testimony. We'd ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.